to our ongoing discussions on the glories of our beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pacharine Nivishesha Shunyavadi Paschata Deshatarane All glories to Sridhar Prabhupada. So yes, we're diving deep again into Sri Vrindavan Dham. Uh, yesterday I was reading Srila Jiva Goswami's uh, Gopal Champu and in the very beginning one of the first verses I found a, a very beautiful description of Sri Vrindavan Dham and the mercy of the Dham and I thought we would begin today with this, this verse and carry on from there. So listen to this. <laughs> Quote, The glorious forest named Vrindavan brings great auspiciousness to the earth goddess. This forest has the power to deliver all living beings in all the worlds. The mere touch of its purifying breeze washes away all troubles. That touch opens the bolt on the door in the prison of the three Vargas. Economic development, sense gratification, and material piety. And it carries away the fragrance of impersonal liberation. With its great glories, it unties the bonds of impersonal liberation. Although in other places the Supreme Personality of Godhead does not easily give the gift of devotional service, in the land of Vrindavan, he gives it very easily." Unquote. <laughs> wow. So, <clears throat> Today we'll be discussing um, another illustrious devotee who spent time in Sri Vrindavan Dham and um, who wrote extensively on um, Radha and Krishna's pastimes. And that is the great Jayadev Goswami. We'll also discuss um, the, his deities, his Ishtadevs, um, Shishi Radha Madhava. So we'll discuss the teachings and we'll discuss um, the personality of um, Jayadev Goswami. In that regard, um, Prabhupada has said we have, we have the Bhagavatam and we have the person Bhagavatam. We have the scriptures and we have the person who uh, exemplifies the scriptures, who teaches us the, the life uh, described in the scriptures. The Bhagavatam and the person Bhagavatam. One, one time a disciple asked Sridhar Prabhupada that of the two, which is more important, the Bhagavatam or the person Bhagavatam? And Sridhar Prabhupada smiled a little bit and he, he replied, what is more important? The person Bhagavatam is more important because he can grab you by the ear. <laughs> in other words, he can be personally involved in our lives and give us direction. <laughs> I thought that was sweet. So just how important is Jayadev Goswami? We'll hear about today. And again, we'll hear about his Istadeva, Shishirada Madhava, who are uh, dear to him and thus very dear to us. Now it's said that uh, Jayadev Goswami was born in either the 11th or the 12th century in a village in Bengal called Kendu Bilva. Kendu Bilva in the district of Birbhum. Um, his, his father's name was Bojadev and his mother's name was Ramadevi. And as we know in the lives of um, all of the great personalities we've been discussing, always their childhood is full of amazing pastimes, miracles actually. So it's no surprise that um, Srila Jayadev Goswami is a young boy, I think he was five or six, he discovered his Ishtadeva, the deities of um, Radha Madhava. Just a small boy. You know, we're, we've been hearing how um, our six Goswamis of Vrindavan, they were young men, mature men, when they, they came to Vrindavan and slowly, slowly they discovered their Ishtadevas in different parts of Braj. But here we have a young boy, <laughs> it's only five or six, Jayadev Goswami and he discovered his deities. Now it's not mentioned where or how he found them, 
but it's written that he worshipped them as a child <coughs> in his youth, <coughs> through his middle age, and into old age, up until the time he departed this world. So from his example, we can see that um, deities appear to a devotee out of that devotee's strong desire to be, to be worshipping them. It's ne never by chance. We were discussing in the, the other day how um, our Lokanath Goswami, he was missing the association of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, so he was thinking if I had a deity of the Lord, I could have that personal association. So Krishna appeared before him personally holding the deity of Radha Vinod and gave it to him. So like this, so for pure devotees who are hankering after the association of the Lord, the Lord makes that arrangement to appear before them as a deity. So this gives some indication how special Jayadev Goswami um, was and is that his deity appeared to him at five years of age. Now, of course, Jayadev Goswami is most famous for his literary contributions. And most notably, his famous work, um, Gita Govinda, Gita Govinda, Therein he describes the loving pastimes of Radha and Krishna. And it's said that Jayadev Goswami wrote Gita Govinda not far from our Mayapur Chandadaira Mandir in West Bengal, very close to that. And in the uh, Gita Govinda, in the beginning he very clearly identifies himself as the author. He writes, and I quote, he who appeared in the village of Kendu Bhilva, just as the moon rises from the ocean, has collected Sri Krishna's expressions of lamentation. That Jayadev is humbly narrating this song." Unquote. <coughs> so we should mention at this point that although Gita Govinda has achieved, I would say, now, um, worldwide popularity, and it's readily available to one and all, it was originally intended for advanced devotees, not for everybody. And actually, in the introduction, um, Jaidev establishes the standard for who's qualified to, to read or hear the Gita Govinda. He writes, and again I quote, if your heart yearns for remembrance of Sri Hari, which bestows all happiness, if you are hankering to contemplate upon Sri Hari with intense affection, and if you are overwhelmed with curiosity to know about Sri Hari's skill in his Madhurya Ras, in his amorous pastimes, then by all means read this book. You may find this poetry very sweet and pleasing. But if you do not nurture these three desires, then this moving and lyrical literature, it's not for you. Only if your heart is full of intense eagerness to fathom Sri Hari's love deliance will you be able to appreciate my beautiful and inspiring uh, poetry. So he's, it's quite clear that one has to be like, this is all one really wants, it's just to enter into this understanding of these very deep and um, intimate loving pastimes of Krishna with his gopis and with Srimati Radharani. That's the qualification. So we're on our way. <laughs> We've, as Confucius said, the longest journey begins with the first step. So we, we, know, what is the, we know what is the goal and we know what pure devotees relish. But um, we can understand that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, would, it's mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita that he would regularly discuss the verses of, of Gita Govinda, but he would only do so with his most confidential associates, Shishrup Damodar and Ramananda Rai. And Prabhupada also made it very clear that of all the songs of Gita Govinda, because it's a compilation of many songs actually, Gita Govinda, um, really only the invocation known as Dash Avatar Stotra, 
is fit to be heard or sung by his followers. Um, in my research, I found a letter to my dear godmother uh, Achutananda Das, which Prabhupada wrote him on July 15, 1972. <coughs> Prabhupada writes, re quote, Regarding the songs by Jayadev Goswami, referring to Gita Govinda, uh, those songs are for Siddha Bhaktas, not for us who are Sarka Bhaktas or learning Bhaktas. Prabhupada is very humble. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya never divulged these in public. He enjoyed them in the company of his selected three or four devotees. There is one song, however, by Jayadev, quote, worshiping the ten incarnations, and this song is all right, unquote. Now, the Acharyas say that actually Jayadev Goswami originally composed Gita Govinda primarily for the pleasure of Lord Jagannath. But again, as Prabhupada mentioned, that particular song in the beginning, Das Avatar Shnotra, in Gita Govinda, that's, that's for everybody. And we know that's often recited by and sung by pious persons, as well as danced to, and it's performed in, in theaters for, we could say, a thousand years now. And we'll hear more about Gita Govinda later. There's a few little parts we can also hear and discuss, sweet and very innocent parts, but um, Jayadev Goswami lived during the, uh, the reign of a king in Bengal whose name was Lakshman Sena. Now, as he grew up, uh, Jayadev mostly kept to himself as a young man growing into uh, in his late teens or his um, early 20s. He kept to himself. He became a renunciate, writing um, poems and different songs about Lord Krishna. But as time went on, his general works became very popular with common people. And in time, those poetic songs, it's described, reached the ears of the king, Lakshman Shen. Now, it was a tra tradition in those days that the king was often entertained by court musicians and um, who would be accompanied, you could say, by, by um, a chorus of singers. And um, so, so one day there was this concert going on and the king was listening. And um, as he looked over towards the, the chorus of singers, he saw that many of them were swaying back and forth with tears in their eyes. So he listened a little, himself, he listened a little more carefully to the words that were being sung and they had a deep impression in his heart as well. Beautiful songs about Krishna and Vrindavan and so forth and so on. So he found himself also crying. <laughs> this is a Rajarishi. <laughs> so when it was over, he, he turned to his chief minister and he said, what saintly person composed that song? And the chief minister replied, Sire, that, was a, that is a, a strict renunciate composed that song, who lives alone in a forest outside of our city. And his name is Jayadev Goswami. And he's loved by the people. So the king, Lakshman Sain, he said, could you please bring him here? I want to meet him. <laughs> but his, his chief minister said, sire, he probably won't come because he's a renunciate and he's he shies away from royalty and opulence. He's just living in seclusion. But Lakshman Sain, the king, he was determined to meet Jayadev Goswami. So what he did is he dressed up as a, uh, in, as a common man in common attire and he went incognito to the, um, the Bhajan Kutir of Jayadev Goswami in the forest. And he was allowed darshan 
and there in front of Jayadev Goswami, it's described he took off that common attire. Underneath, he was dressed as, as the king. And he invited Jayadev Goswami to, to give up that um, bhajan kutir in, in the forest and to come live in the royal palace and to write there. And he said to them, he said to Jayadev Goswami, everything will be taken care of for you, Wh whatever you need. I'll, I'll provide that. Just please come and reside in my palace and write your beautiful poetry and your songs. Everything will be provided. So Jayadev Goswami, he looked around his kutir. There's practically nothing there. <laughs> he didn't need much. He looked around his humble dwelling and he said, actually, I have everything I need here. Simple living with high thinking. And in my heart, I'm fully satisfied worshipping my beautiful Sri Sri Radha Madhav and writing my poetry and my songs. But Lakshman Shane, the king, he was determined. He said, yes, it's, it's the king said, yes, it's true what you said. Um, you have the right to live here in a secluded place because you're a renunciate. But bear in mind, you're a sadhu. And you're meant to share your knowledge and wisdom with others. He said, without the association of saints such as yourself, how will the common man and royalty like me ever become freed from the vicious cycle of birth and death? So at that point, <coughs> Jayadev Goswami was silent because there was some truth in what the king said. So then the king proposed, he said, this is what I'll do. There's a very beautiful um, forest, some distance away, but not far from my palace. It's called Champahati. It's a forest of Champak trees, and no one lives there. Only the birds and the bees and the wild animals of the forest, and there's a river flowing through there. Please come and make your bhajan kutir there. You can continue writing, but in this way, you'll be very close to me. Very close to where I am. I can just walk out and come into that beautiful forest. And from time to time, myself and others can come and take the dust of your lotus feet. Come closer. Right now, this where you are, it's too far away. Come closer so that we can have your sangha. So, being the Vaishnava that he was, and knowing that the primary duty of a Vaishnava is to deliver others, Jayadev, he agreed. So he moved into that Champak Hati, that little forest, and Lakshman Shain um, actually built a little temple next to his Bhajan Kutir, next to Jayadev Goswami's Bhajan Kutir for Radha Madhava. And it's described that was the first, that provided the, the facility for the first formal worship of his deities, Radha Madhava, at that time. Because like other renunciates, he was offering, you know, the fruits and the vegetables that he found in the forest. But he was happy. <coughs> and he kept writing his poems and his songs. And the king would come from time to time and they'd have discussions on Krishna Kata. <laughs> But after a couple of years, a few years actually, um, one day King Lakshman Sain came to Jayadev Goswami and he requested him to go to, to Jagannath Puri for a special function. Now, we, we should mention that, um, of course, what we did mention that uh, Jayadev Goswami was born here, he appeared in, in Bengal. But at that time, he was living near Navadweep in, in Navadweep, Mayapur, and that's where Lakshman Shane actually had his palace. So the king asked him to leave, <coughs> to, to leave from Navadweep and go to Jagannath Puri, you know, for a special function. But it's not explained exactly how it happened, but once he was there, Jayadev Goswami became the court poet of the king of Arissa. So we're talking about some Raja Rishis here, some saintly person sitting on the throne. 
they wanted the association of saintly persons. They were very busy with materialistic fairers often, but they wanted the association of these saints. So somehow Jayadev Goswami became the um, court poet of this king of Orissa, and he stayed there for quite some time. And <clears throat> eventually he got married. Now it's very interesting um, how that happened. We, we can see it was actually the will of the Lord. That he, from, from the being a great renunciate, he became a, a great householder. And the, the pastime unfolds as such that there was a, a Brahmana from South India. His name was Sudeva. And he had no children. He and his wife had no children. So one day, this Brahmana, Sudeva, he journeyed from South India to Jagannath Puri. And he went into the temple. And he prayed to Lord Jagannath, quote, O Lord, if I ever get a child, I will give him to you. Whether a boy or a girl, I will give my first child to you, please. So after some time, his wife became pregnant and gave birth to a beautiful daughter who they named Padmavati. And um, when she was 12 years old, Sudeva brought her from South India back to uh, Jagannath Puri to fulfill his promise to the Lord. And um, he came before the deity of, of Jagannath in the temple. And he said, Oh Lord, as I promised, I've brought my first child to you. Here she is. She's my daughter. She's yours. So immediately, Lord Jagannath replied to this Brahmana, Sudeva. So we can understand he's also an exalted soul that the Lord is speaking to him. <laughs> and Lord Jagannath said, quote, uh, My dear Sudeva, there is a devotee named Jayadeva Goswami. He's an exalted personality and very dear to me. Take your daughter to him in the forest and ask him to accept her hand in marriage. You can tell him this is my very order. So it's interesting, once again we hear a pastime where the, the deity of the Lord is speaking to his devotee. We've discussed a number of these pastimes in the, fast, in the past few months. And this should convince us that, again, the deity of the Lord is not different than the Lord. And what's more, that each deity has a, a special mood in different pastimes. All the deities are Krishna, but um, each deity has a special mood. Like, of course, the deity of Nisringadev, he has a special mood. Krishna and Balaram, they have a special mood. They, their pastimes are with cowherd boys. And Radha and Krishna, they have their particular moods um, with the gopis of Vrindavan. So different deities have different <coughs> unique moods. Once Srila Prabhupada was taking darshan of Rukmini Dorkadish in Los Angeles, and afterwards his secretary asked him, um, Srila Prabhupada, what were you praying for? And Prabhupada replied, Oh, I was praying to Rukmini Dwarkadish to engage me in the service of Radharasa Bihari in Bombay. <coughs> like that. <coughs> so each deity is unique. Another time I was uh, reading, another time in Dallas, Texas, Srila Prabhupada said to the, the head Pujari in our temple there, You're the intimate uh, servant of this deity. So what is the mood of this deity? And the Pujari didn't know what to say. <laughs> so Prabhupada mildly chastised him. He said, you're serving this deity for so long, you should know the mood of this deity. So we all pray by Prabhupada's mercy that we can come to that platform where we can understand the, the mood of Krishna. <laughs> so with the Lord's order, on his head, Sudeva went to the forest with his daughter and he met Jayadeva Goswami. And Sudeva said 
to Jayadev Goswami. O Maharaj, kindly accept my daughter as your wife and engage her in your service. So Jayadev Goswami was like surprised. He's a renunciate in the forest. <laughs> He's getting a marriage proposal. So he, he said to, to Sudeva, uh, O Brahmana, what are you saying? I'm a poor person living in the forest. You should give your daughter to a qualified Brahmana who has the right to accept her hand, who is well situated in society. Then Sudeva, he said, but I was ordered by Lord Jagannath to give my daughter to you, and so it is your duty to obey his command. Please do not think of disobeying the Lord's order, for if you do so, you will be tainted by the offense of violating his command. So then Jayadev Goswami, he said, Lord Jagannath may keep thousands of women in his service, and it will only enhance his beauty. But for me to keep one wife, that will be a huge burden. Therefore, I will not accept your daughter. Please take her and return home. Now, Sudeva, he was determined because number one, he wanted to marry his daughter, or num and number two, or maybe it should be number one, he wanted to fulfill the, the order of the Lord. So he turned to his daughter, and then he said, <coughs> Dear one, I must follow Lord Jagannath's order. I cannot disobey him. So I am requesting you to stay here and not move. And then he left. There's Jayadev Goswami, the renunciate, and this beautiful young girl <laughs> in front of him. <laughs> so, at that point, it's described, Jayadev was a little perplexed what he should do with this young girl. So finally he said to her, um, young girl, I'm not suitable, I'm not a suitable husband for you. I will not be able to carry out the responsibility of maintaining you. So hearing this, young Padmavati, she folded her hands and she said to, to Jayadev Goswami, my dear husband, <laughs> Whether it brings happiness or distress, I've given my heart to you. I, I, I've, I've dedicated my life to you. So hearing her chaste words and seeing her, uh, it's described her remarkable determination, Jayadev Goswami realized that this was indeed the Lord Jagannath's desire and he must have a higher purpose. So based on that, he said, yes, then I will accept you as my wife. And I was thinking, this is the nature of a, of a pure devotee of the Lord, or let us just say, any advanced devotee of the Lord, that um, he always puts the desire of the Lord before his desire. And the same principle holds true for a disciple who sees his spiritual master as a representative of Krishna. He always puts the desire of his spiritual master before his own desire. So after their marriage, uh, Jayadev Goswami and uh, Padmavati, they returned to the kingdom of um, Lakshman Sena and they lived in that little forest of, of Champak trees, Champatahati, not too far from the palace. Now, it was during this period that Jayadev Goswami began writing Gita Govinda. And I'd like to take a moment to, to share a very beautiful and innocent part of, of Gita Govinda with you, something that's appropriate for us to hear, so you can appreciate um, primarily to, so you can appreciate Srila um, Jayadev Goswami's poetic expertise. And this, in this particular song, uh, Jayadev Goswami is describing how Krishna is waiting for Srimati Radharani at a rendezvous spot called Dira Shamira, Dira Samira, or Dira Samira Ghat, 
because it's on the bank of the Jamuna. So one gopi says to Srimati Radharani, Dira Samire Jamuna Tirde Vasati Vani Vanamali. Decorated with a forest garland, Krishna eagerly awaits you in a grove on the windswept bank of the Jamuna. So beautiful. Dressed in a most attractive way, Krishna has crossed all obstacles to meet you by the shore of the Jamuna, where a soft breeze carries the scent of sandalwood from the Malayan hills. Over and over again, he checks to see if the decorations in the grove are just right. Then he walks out into the courtyard and looks down the path for you. Not seeing you, he gives a sigh of sorrow. O Radha, using the cloak of night, go to meet him, but please leave your telltale ankle bells behind. Sri <laughs> Radha, you glow like a uh, shining lightning. But of what use is such overwhelming beauty if it cannot rule over a monsoon cloud decorated by a formation of flying swans? Oh, Shiratha. <laughs> it's so beautiful. You can just see how poetic he is. And this is, you know, it's not the original Sanskrit. If we knew the original Sanskrit, we understood it, then it would flow much <laughs> even better to our hearts. So Srila Go, um, Jayadev Goswami concludes uh, this, this particular song by advising his readers, and it's very beautiful. He addresses his readers as saints. He's so gracious. He says, O saints, Krishna is joyful and gentle. Give your heart to Radha, Krishna, and their pastimes together, that all three will appear within your mind. O oh, saints, Krishna is joyful and gentle. Give your heart to your hearts to Shridhara, Krishna, and their pastimes together. Then all three will appear within your minds. So wonderful. Just a little, little tiny part of Gita Govinda, just so we can appreciate what a beautiful, poetic, and devotional writer he was. Now, for a very famous pastime of um, Jayadev Goswami, his wife Padmavati and, uh, and Gita Govinda. So one day in the late morning, as Jayadev was riding Gita Govinda and Padmavati was cooking lunch, Jayadev started writing a particular part in the Gita Govinda where he was describing um, in Krishna's pastimes, how it appeared that he was controlled by the love of the gopis, particularly Srimati Radharani, and thus he was subordinate to them. But and he was trying to, you know, write a particular phrase to to describe that. But then he stopped short, and he said to himself, "Can I write such a thing? Krishna is the supreme controller." How can he be controlled by the gopis and Srimati Radharani? If he's the, the supreme controller, how can be, he be controlled by their love? And if it's true, how in the world do I describe it? So it's, it's kind of a dilemma. It's called writer's block. <laughs> Those of you who are writers, you'll know that sometimes you're writing and you're writing, all of a sudden, you can't think of what to write next. So when you get this writer's block, you just take a break and you know, you refresh yourself and you come back and sometimes the, the thoughts start flowing again. So this is what Jayadev Goswami decided to do. He decided to take a break from his writing to think about it. So he, he told his wife, Padmavati, that you know, she's still cooking. He said, I'm going to take a, a, a bath in the Ganges, think about some things for a little while, and I should be back soon. So then, one of the most amazing things ever in Vaishnav history took place. And that was that while Jayadev Goswami was away taking his bath, Krishna 
disguised as Jayadev Goswami, came to Jayadev's house, walked in, perhaps made a comment, you know, to Padmavati, um, you know, when, when's Prasadam? <laughs> and he, Krishna disguised it Jayadev, as Jayadev Goswami, went over to Jayadev Goswami's desk, picked up his pen, and wrote at that exact place where Jayadev had hesitated to write something. He wrote a very famous shloka, with in particular a very famous line. And what did Krishna write? He wrote, Shmara Garla Kandanam, Mama Sirasa Mandanam, Dehi Para Palavam Udaram, Chualati Mai Dorunaha, Manda Kadana Antaha, Karatu Tat Upahita Vikara. He wrote, quote, Speaking to Srimati Radharani, who was displaying jealous anger towards him, Krishna implored, O beloved, your tender sprout-like feet are the antidote to Cupid's venom. Please place them on my head as my ornament and my glory. The scorching fire of Cupid's poison is unbearable. Please, therefore, let the touch of your feet quell the torment of my love. So the most famous line is, Dehi para palavan udaram. Please place your feet on my head as my ornament and glory. Now, of course, that's indicating that, <laughs> you know, Krishna's subordinate to the love of Srimati Radharani. <laughs> Please place your feet on my head, or sometimes it's said, let me, Krishna's saying, let me place my head upon your feet. Subordinate to the love of Sri Radha, her Mahabhav. Became very clear. So with that, Krishna disguised as Jayadev Goswami, came over and sat down and, and took the prasadam that was prepared by uh, Padmavati. And after finishing the prasadam, Krishna, as Jayadev, told Padmavati, um, I'm going to go to, uh, for a walk. I'm full, so I'm going to go for a walk. And he walked outside and he disappeared. And a few minutes later, what happened? The real Jayadev Goswami returned from his bath in the Ganges. And he came in and the first thing he said was, uh, I'm hungry, when's Prashana going to be ready? <laughs> and she looked at him incredulously, like, what? She said, Jayadev, you... <laughs> You, 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 you came back earlier, you went to your desk, you wrote something, you took prasadam and you just left 10 minutes ago. So hearing this, Jayadev was astonished. He was trying to think, like, what, what's... Be, being, but being the transcendentalist he was, he knew something incredible was happening. He said, I came back. I wrote something, I took prasadam, I left. So very slowly he walked over to his desk and there he saw in wet ink, in particular that line, Dehi Pada Palavam Udaram. Radha, please place your feet on my head as my ornament and glory. Which again clearly indicated that Krishna the Supreme Controller was controlled by the love of his devotees and most notably his beloved Srimati Radharani. So he screamed, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, as tears of ecstasy flowed from his eyes. And he called out, Padmavati, you are most fortunate. Krishna himself has written the line, Dehi para palavam udaram. And he has accepted prasadam from your own hand. <laughs> A wonderful pastime. The Gita Govinda is composed by Srila Jayadev Goswami, but there's that one verse penned by the Supreme Lord Himself, admitting that He's controlled by the love of Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani. <laughs> so um, <laughs> when He finished the Gita Govinda, He concluded it with. A very beautiful prayer. 
we often say that something important should be uh, finished on a high note. So listen to how he concludes Gita Govinda. He writes, and I quote, Whatever is delightful in the varieties of music, whatever is graceful in fine strains of poetry, and whatever is exquisite in the sweet art of love, let the happy and wise persons learn that from the songs of Gita Govinda. Whatever is delightful in the varieties of music, whatever is graceful in the fine strains of poetry, and whatever is exquisite in the sweet art of love, let the happy and wise persons learn that from the songs of Gita Govinda. Shri <laughs> Gita Govinda ki, Shri Jayadev Goswami ki, Mother Padmavati ki. So again, although Gita Govinda is reserved for the Paramahamsas, swan-like devotees, there's little bits and pieces, some parts that as aspiring devotees we can also appreciate. And just a little example, because we can only take a little. A, a nice example I'd like to share is that um, I've heard that throughout Gita Govinda, Jayadev Goswami is always describing Krishna's body as bluish black, bluish black. There's one verse, he writes, um, with his soft bluish black limbs, which resemble blue lotus flowers, Krishna has created a spring festival for Cupid. So therein he's, he's referring again, Krishna's um, limbs are bluish black in color. And I read also recently that this um, bodily color of Krishna, his complexion, is often described in three ways, three different ways. As Nila, blue, Shama, black, and Shamala, bluish black. Three different ways. And um, also I was thinking that, um, well, Prabhupada writes in Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, second chapter, uh, verse 31 in a purport, Prabhupada writes, uh, there was nothing comparable to the bodily features of Lord Krishna when he was present in this world. The most beautiful object in the material world may be compared to the blue lotus flower or the full moon in the sky, but even the blue lotus flower and the moon were defeated by the beauty of the bodily features of Lord Krishna. So there's some, you know, whatever is beautiful in this world doesn't compare to the, the beauty of Krishna, but it, it, some indication is given there. The, the blue lotus flower, something very beautiful. So we get an, we, by hearing about the blue lotus flower, we can get an idea of what the transcendental beauty of, of, of Lord Krishna is. Srila Prabhupada often um, y uses um, two colors interchangeably to describe Krishna. For example, he'll write, I found um, one quote, Krishna's complexion is like a dark blue cloud. And I found another description Prabhupada gave, Krishna's bodily color resembles a fresh black cloud. Just trying to help us understand. So a dark blue cloud and a fresh black cloud. We get some idea. And um, Ru Shri Rupa Goswami has written that, I was reading, the touch of Krishna's blue cheeks changed the color of his flute from its natural uh, bamboo yellow to the deep blue-black color of a sapphire. Again, we're talking about the color of Krishna's body, but it appears that, according to Rupa Goswami, when Krishna takes his flute, which is um, a yellowish color, bamboo yellow color, and it touches his cheeks as he's playing it, that flute turns deep blue-black, the deep blue-black color of a sapphire. But Krishna, but, uh, but Krishna, not the, Krishna's not, I was also reading, Krishna's not the only one who has the power to turn things blue. <laughs> I read one pastime where 
um, Radharani can do the same thing. One time Krishna placed a, a white lotus bud into the curly locks of Radharani's hair and the flower at once turned blue. Indivara it's described. Indivara, Indivara blue. So Radharani has the same potency. Krishna can turn his flute blue. Radharani can turn white flowers in her hair blue. <laughs> Actually many things are infused with the color of Krishna's body, you could say in one sense. Um, one time Prabhupada said that, quote, Krishna's bodily uh, effulgence, which is the Brahma Jyoti, is responsible for tinting the sky with its bluish rays. Krishna's bodily effulgence, the Brahma Jyoti, is responsible for tinting the sky with its bluish rays. In other words, to put it very simply, the sky is blue because Krishna is blue. It's a reflection of his transcendental form. This is how we're being trained to see Krishna everywhere. Oh, the sky is blue. It reminds me of Krishna. Now, one time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said <coughs> that the actual bluish black color of Krishna can only be perceived with spiritual eyes. Because that color, that bluish black color of Krishna, that color is one of the unlimited colors of the spiritual world, not present in this material world. Here we have, what is it, five primary colors, and you mix them, you get so many different colors, but they're limited, because everything in this world is, unlim is limited. But the spiritual world is unlimited, so there's unlimited colors. And one of those colors is the colors of, of Krishna's body, the color of Krishna's body. So, premanjane charity bhakti valochanena. If we really want to see and appreciate this um, bluish back or bluish color, the various ways it's described of Krishna, we have to see with the eyes of pure devotion. But just to give us an idea, Krishna, that color is compared to things of this world who have that bluish color. Like one time, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he described the um, material world as a dictionary for the spiritual world. Some objects of this world can give us an idea of what the spiritual world is like, just like a dictionary. You, you have a dictionary and there's the word in black and white, horse, with a description of the horse. You know, it's a four-legged animal, it stands this high, it has a mane, it has a tail, it eats grass. <laughs> so you, it's not the horse, but you get an idea of what a horse is like. So he said, the material world can sometimes act as a dictionary to understand what is the spiritual world. So there's certain objects in this world which can give us an idea of the blueness of Krishna, the bluish blackness of Krishna. Therefore, Sometimes Krishna's bodily hue is compared to that of blue lotuses, for example, or sapphires, or dark rain clouds. Oh yeah, so that's what Krishna... Or a tamal tree, or carillium. Or I read one time how Krishna's bluish black body is compared to a swarm, a swarm of bees, or the, the, the color of the Jamuna River, like this. We're getting some idea. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, um, our, our Acharyas have written that after Jayadev Goswami completed his Gita Govinda, and this is really interesting, Lord Chaitanya appeared to him and gave him a full darshan of his transcendental form. Now bear in mind, this is hundreds of years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu makes his appearance in Navadvip, Mayapur Dham. But there in that Dham, because Jayadeva and Padmavati had moved back to Navadvip, Mahaprabhu appeared. It wasn't a dream, it, there he was. And he revealed to Jayadeva Goswami that in time he would appear in Navadvip and he would inaugurate the Sankirtan movement, the Yuga Dharma, the process of chanting Hare Krishna in the age of Kali. 
And he also revealed how he himself, Mahaprabhu, would later shift to, uh, to Jagannath Puri and there he would relish Jayadev Goswami's Gita Govinda. What a wonderful prize and reward you could say. He just finished the, the Gita, the, the, the Gita Govinda. <sighs> Mahaprabhu appears. I'm going to be hearing this book several hundred years when I appear as the Yuga Avatar. Uh, and, and when I go to Jagannath Puri. So being obedient to the order of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Jayadev Goswami and his wife, they returned to Jagannath Puri with the finished Gita Govinda. And very quickly, the glories of that book spread throughout Arisa and then throughout India. So much so that at one point, um, they um, began, uh, the Pujaris began reading the um, Gita Govinda every day to Lord Jagannath in the temple there. It became a standard practice. And as we mentioned earlier, um, this was the, the, the one of the underlying reasons that Jayadev Goswami had, had written Gita Govinda for the pleasure of Lord Jagannath. So it was arranged by the Lord. Mahaprabhu appeared. All right, go. <laughs> and the book was read. So Jayadev Goswami lived in Puri and he continued his writings. But it's described that he also took time to visit various holy places around India, including um, Sri Vrindavan Dham. And when it's written that when Jayadev Goswami visited Vrindavan, he brought his Radhamanava deities with him and he worshipped them in a small grass hut on the banks of the Jamuna River at Keshigat. And every day he would sing his Gita Govinda to his deities and melt the hearts of the few sadhus who were living in the Vrindavan forest at that time. We have to remember this is hundreds of years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed the six Goswamis to go to that jungle and discover the lost places of Krishna's pastime. So we can just imagine what it was like hundreds of years before. There were just a few sadhus living there. There were no temples. Um, so Jayadev Goswami just lived as a, as a humble sadhu near Keshigad and he worshipped um, his Radha Madhava deities there. Went back to a simple standard. Um, now, <clears throat> honoring Jayadev Goswami's time in, in Vrindavan, he spent some considerable time in Vrindavan. Honoring that, there is um, a, a Pushpa Samadhi, his Pushpa Samadhi on the banks of Radhakund. So I, I think that when we eventually <laughs> uh, Go, it, are able to do our Kartik Parikama, we can um, all go there and remembering this, these wonderful pastimes of Jayadev Goswami and his illustrious wife and um, the pious king Lakshman Sain <laughs> and his Gita Govinda, we can go there and we can remember all this, pay our dandabats in front of that Pushpa Samadhi at, um, at Radha Kund. Now, some say that his Radha Madhava deities are presently being worshipped in Jayapur at Kanak Vrindavan. That means just before you get into um, Jayapur, there's Kanak Vrindavan, a little area called Kanak Vrindavan. And um, uh, it's a beautiful garden and there's palatial buildings there and very beautiful deities. Shishi Radha Madhava. Some say those are the deities of Jayadev Goswamis. Others, they say that Radha Madhava are being worshipped in his birthplace in Bengal. In um, a temple called um, the Temple of Radha Vinod. And this temple was constructed by, um, a few hundred years ago, by King uh, Kirti Chandra of Burdwan in order to preserve the legacy and the birthplace of Jayadev Goswami. So some devotees say that's where the deities eventually um, wound up. Hare Krishna. Now, before we conclude, <laughs> we have a way to go, but there's a few uh, 
noteworthy pastimes connected to this epic work of um, Gita Govinda that were that are worth mentioning. And the first is that <clears throat> many years after the departure of Jayadev Goswami, a king uh, of Puri at that time, uh, that king, his name was um, King Purushottam Deva. He wrote a book which he called Abhinava Gita Govinda. Abhinava Gita Govinda. And um, he considered that his book was superior to the Gita Govinda written by Jayadev Goswami. Yeah, somehow he thought like that. So he told the Pujaris in the temple not to read any more uh, Jayadev Goswami's book, Gita Govinda. Other things were being read as well, but no longer this um, work of Jayadev Goswami, but read my, my book, Abhinava Govinda, Abhinata, Abhinava Gita Govinda. So there were naturally some objections because people were very attached to the Gita Govinda of Jayadev Goswami. And so due to the, you could say, the politic politically sensitive nature <laughs> of his desire, because he's the king, right? So he's saying, do this, so it's sensitive. So the, te the temple brahmanas, the priests, who are also very powerful, they decided to um, let the Lord be the judge for himself. Which book should be read? The king's book or Jayadev Goswami's book? So how was the Lord to judge? Well, what they did is the Pujaris took both the king's book and Jayadev Goswami's book and one evening before putting the Lord to sleep, they placed those two books on the altar in front of Jagannath, Baladev, and Subhadra. And then they closed the doors for the night. They locked the doors. Somehow other they thought that the, <laughs> the Lord will make it clear, because he's Jagannath. <laughs> he's the Supreme Lord, so let him make the decision. And sure enough, the next morning when the Pajaris came and they opened the temple doors, the proof was there. <laughs> and what was the proof? The proof was that the, that the king's book, that the pages of the king's book were scattered everywhere all over the altar. On the ground, on the altar, everywhere, all squished up and thrown here. <laughs> and Jayadev Goswami's Gita Govinda, it's described, was nestled under the Lord's arm, under Lord Jagannath's arm, was nestled, his Gita Govinda, very close to Jagannath's heart. So the Bajari said, the Lord has given his verdict. <laughs> it's a wonderful pastime. <laughs> Dagonath made it very clear, that's what he wanted to hear. And the king accepted. He, king, he was, the king is re the representative of the Lord. So he was pious, maybe he made a little error there, but he said, all right. So there's another pastime that um, took place around 300 years um, after Jayadev Goswami had departed this world. And on that occasion, um, Lord Jagannath in Jagannath Puri was sleeping after his midday meal. And there was a florist, a young girl, who was picking flowers in a garden on the temple grounds. And while she was doing that, she was singing Gita Govinda. Now, as she was singing, <laughs> Lord Jagannath woke up. He was attracted to this spontaneous performance of his favorite work. And what he did, he was so attracted to this young girl singing, he left the temple. He left the temple. And he came to that garden and he, he hid in the bushes there. And it's described that those bushes were very thorny. And they were, they were um, tearing at his clothes and they actually scratched his body. But he didn't care. He, he loved Gita Govinda and the purity of this Vaishnavi singing. So after some time, he, he described he returned to the altar just in time to give his um, blessings to, to the devotees at the four o'clock Arctic, you could say. They have a pro afternoon in the program, so 
you know, the doors are open and then the offering is made and everyone comes. So he made it back just in time. But the Pujaris were shocked. They looked up and they saw the, it's described, their ragged and wounded Lord. They saw their ragged and wounded Lord. And it pierced their hearts. How is it that the Lord's clothes are torn? What are the scratches on his body? So they ran to tell the king. The king at that particular time in history. And who was that king? Well, we know him from Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's the famous Maharaj Patapurudra, great devotee of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And he became very concerned. He's the king. <laughs> He's in charge of the temple, actually, and the worship of the Lord. So he came and his heart was broken. How's Jagannath's clothes been ripped? And scratches on his body but as much as he investigated he couldn't understand no one knew that the Lord it was secret he'd left the temple into the garden <laughs> amongst the thorn bushes to hear the sweet singing of his devotee we should hope one day that our kirtan Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare will be so pure that he can attract the attention of the Lord that's our, that's kirtan. Kirtan is meant for the glorification of the Lord. If it's done with a pure heart, um, he'll come. <laughs> Hopefully one day. So the king couldn't figure it out. Maharaj Bhatta Parudra. But one night, <clears throat> Jagannath appeared to him in a dream and explained everything that had happened. How he heard the singing, he left the temple, the thorn bushes, and he said, so don't worry. This is why it happened. But Maharaj Pataparudra, being the great devotee he was, he, um, he, 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 for him, this revealed the very strong attachment that Lord Jagannath had to hearing um, the, the Gita Govinda. So he, he issued a, a decree actually, a famous decree. And here's what the decree that he issued, and it's still being followed down to the present day. There were many different bhajans going on at the temple at that time, we understand. But this is the decree that he wrote. Quote, to all the citizens of Jagannath Puri, performances of song and dance for Jagannath and Balaram and Lady Subhadra, will consist from now on solely those from Gita Govinda and no other work. Performers are therefore instructed to learn the songs of Gita Govinda exclusively. Four musicians will accompany the dancers who dance in front of, um, who dance the Gita Govinda in, in front of our deities. Others may follow in a chorus of singing temple officials who allow any other songs to be performed in front of our deities shall be deemed enemies of Jagannath. Wow. This is Rajrishi. This is the kingdom of God. So to the credit of the temple management, this tradition is followed down to the present day. Shri Gita Govinda Ki, Shri Jagannath Swami, Lady Subhadra Balaram Ki. Wow. <sighs> Maharaj Bhatta Barudra, <laughs> Jayadev Goswami. So many devotees we can glorify. <sighs> so today I would like to conclude. I, I wish I didn't have to conclude, but yes. I'd like to conclude our glorification of Srila Jayadev Goswami with a very um, beautiful poem written by the, the medieval poet Vaishnav Das. Um, he, he, he entitled it, God's Choicest Poet. God's Choicest Poet. A famous um, poet, Vaishnav Das. And um, we'll read the, the verses from that poem. He's glorifying um, First of all, um, Jayadev Goswami, but other great Vaishnava poets as well. And but then we'll finally conclude with a, a, a beautiful mantra um, 
by um, a good friend of mine again, Hari Prashad Prabhu from the GBC Shastrik Committee. I, I asked him, I said, please can you help me find the prana mantra for uh, Jayadev Goswami? And as much research as he did, there wasn't one. So I said, you know, you're a wonderful Vaishnava, you know Sanskrit, and you've been contributing so much to our ISKCON movement with your scholarly knowledge um, and your disciple of, of um, Radha Govinda Maharaj. So could, could you make a nice mantra up glorifying um, Jayadev Goswami I can finish with? And he very humbly said, if you, if you ask Maharaj, I said, I'm asking <laughs> for the pleasure of the devotees. So we'll finish with that um, prana mantra. So first let us hear from, um, from Vaishnava Das. And I'll, I'll quote the first verse of his prayer, God's choicest poet. Jaya Jayadeva Kavi, Nuripati Siromani, Vidyapati Rasadham, Jaya Jay Chandi Das, Rasa Shekara, Akila Bhuvane Anupam. All glories to uh, Sri Jayadev, the crest jewel amongst poetic kings. All glories to Vidyapati, the abode of Rasa. All glories to Sri Chandidas, the greatest connoisseur of Rasa. These poets are unparalleled in their excellence in the three worlds. In verse number two, the creation, the creations of these poets were pristine songs describing um, Madhuriras. These songs were written in prose and verse, and they were relished by Lord Gorachandra, along with Rai Ramananda and Surup Damodar. Number three, when Rai Ramananda and Surup Damodar desired to awaken a particular mood within the Lord, they would sing these songs. Hearing their singing, even wood and stones would melt. Such were the sweet pastimes of these three individuals. And finally he writes, those moods and emotions of Sri Radha, which were hidden from the masses in general, were demonstrated with great effort by my Lord Gora to one and all. Now that he has disappeared from uh, external vision, these rasas do not touch my heart, even on listening to these songs. Oh, this Vaishnav Das simply laments and cries. So again, deep subject matters. But um, it's nice to hear the glorification of these pure devotees and the subject matters for which they're um, discussing. Cheta darpana marjanam, cheta darpana marjanam, cleansing the heart. So let us now um, finish with a very beautiful um, mantra glorifying Jayadev Goswami by Hari Prashad Prabhu. Padmavati Pariyam Sharimach. Chitanya Dvita Vanmayam, Gita Govinda Kartharam, Jayadev Kavim uh, Numaha. To him who is dear to, Bap, to Padmavati, to him whose literature was greatly respected by Sri Chaitanya, to the composer of Gita Govinda, to Sri Jayadev Kavi, we offer our obeisances. So wonderful. Paramatra gives the essence of a place or a pastime or a person. So I think that um, Hari Prashad, you know, really caught that essence based on what we've discussed today. He caught that very nicely. To him who is dear to Padmavati, to him whose literature was greatly respected by Sri Chaitanya, to the composer of Gita Govinda, to Sri Jayadev Kavi, we offer our obeisances. And certainly that prayer he has in the invocation of the glorifying the ten avatars. We're singing that um, often, aren't we? When we glorify different incarnations um, of the Lord. So we all have much to be grateful to for um, Srila Jayadev Goswami. Hare Krishna. I hope I did that illustrious personality justice today. I'm not really so qualified. But I'm very thankful for this opportunity um, to discuss these things with all of you. And um, we'll continue in a few days. I'm thinking that we'll do um, 
Shamananda Pandit. We mentioned the other day Narottam, Srinivasachari, and Shamananda Pandit. So it just came to my mind. There's Shamananda Pandit had so many wonderful pastimes, instructive pastimes for us as aspiring devotees, and in his leelas in um, Sri Vrindavan Dham. So give me a couple of days, and we'll be back. Thank you. Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Brindavan Eshwati, Shimati Radha Rani Ki, Shri Jayadev Goswami Ki, Mother Padmavati Ki, Shri Gita Govinda Ki, Jagannath Subhadra Baladeva Ki, Shri Jagannath Puri Dham Ki, Navadvip Mayapur Dham Ki, Shri Vrindavan Dham Ki, Shri Rupavupada Ki, Back Home, Back to Godhead, everybody with us. J J C C Radhe Sharm Shishi Radha Madhava Ki Hare Krishna. See you soon. <laughs>